With the outbreak of the nuclear war between Russia and the United States, citizens who found themselves boarding the trains of the metro found some safety from the bombs that fell and irradiated the land and sky above. This safety would be strictly temporary, however. As creatures began to mutate into fearsome beasts on the surface, the age-old saying of, as above, so below, started to bleed through. Creatures under the ground also began to turn into twisted forms of themselves. No such enemy threatens the remnants of humanity on a daily basis, quite like the Nasalis. The demons cannot get into the tunnels. The watchmen typically hang out on the surface. The shrimps prefer large bodies of water which are not too common unless you are near Venice, which leaves the Nasalis to battle it out over control of the territory. Humanity, once being the apex predator of Earth, now share this title with the creature that in more cases than not can overpower the bipedal ape. What makes the Nasalis such a threat though is how they are able to completely overrun armed soldiers. Let's run down the list of their morphology, offensive capabilities, behavior, and different variants that have been a result from the inability of humanity to coexist with itself. The Nasalis is going to be the most encountered creature that lives underground lurking in the metro. They have adapted to be very successful predators who have become extremely territorial in the scarcity that is post-war Moscow. So territorial in fact that they will run into gunfire and heavily armed men in some cases they will actually even win. Also I just want to point out I'm pretty sure in every single video I've made I have said said Moscow in a different way. So, a little fun fact, just go write that down, because I am I, I keep looking up the word, but God help me, I don't know how to pronounce it. Moscow. Anyways, of course, they have another aspect to thank for that, basically them winning. It's going to be their large numbers and how quickly they grow. Their morphological traits of the Nasalis is one adapted to an extremely hostile environment. You would think living underground there would be less predators, but just like the creatures that live on the surface, they too must change change to thrive where they live. The Nasalis is going to be a large bipedal organism with a relatively humanoid shape. However, even being bipedal, they will use their knuckles much like an ape to aid in walking. The reasoning is they were actually quadrupedal before their forced evolution, so they haven't completely lost that adaptation that predisposes them to walk on their hands. Speaking of arms, they're going to be fairly long, perhaps a little longer than the legs, ending in three digits. These digits are going to be tipped with razor sharp claws used for slashing open pretty much anything, but also digging through the tough permafrost of the tundra. There is another claw that seems to jut out from the arms of the Nasalis, but this could just be used for a weapon. It is possible that it is the vestigial remnants of a finger, and I mean vestigial only in the sense that it can't be used as a finger. Used in pretty much the attacks, it creates another point of contact that would be probably causing some hemorrhaging, leading to a quick bleed out of the prey. The back of the creature is arched with a large hump, almost like the creature is constantly hunching, but then again, technically they're leaning forward when they walk and run, so this could explain their overall posture. However, moving on to the legs, they are going to be digigrade, which makes sense considering the animal that they used to be contained a similar structure with the same type of legs. In fact, a lot of mammals seem to appear to have the digigrade, whereas humanity does not. Kind of strange how humans ended up that way. Anyways, saving the best for last, let's look into the actual eyes of this thing and really get a good look at its face. The skin only appears to exist on half of the face. The eyes of the creature sit further back and are relatively small, suggesting that it doesn't actually need to see, that it doesn't see, or it just has very poor vision. The portion closest to the mouth shows how fearsome the creature has become. There is going to exist a nose that is quite large, which considering the location and size of the the eyes says that this creature is going to be hunting by smell rather than by sight. So when it comes across something that smells tasty enough, for instance a human, it will use its razor sharp claws to slash at the person killing them, or by using its dagger like teeth to sink into the person's face and probably hit something vital. Ultimately, if this creature gets a hold of a person, you more than likely will not be able to stop the bleeding from the attack anyways, so there's a high chance it will kill you even if you do kill it. There is no armor on the Nasalis, but it does contain a tough layer of skin which can help it survive point blank gunfire. Even with a shotgun from a range as close as the barrel 
barrel pressed against it, the creature can live through the shot and continue to press the attack. The issue also remains that this creature is going to be exceedingly agile and a very quick runner. They can descend upon a group by running on the ground or by running on the walls. If you find yourself up against a pack, which coincidentally is how they prefer to attack you, your best bet is to just keep putting lead down range. If they do get close, one could be climbing above your head without you even knowing it, and the last thing you will see is a mouthful of teeth dropping down. There are many different variants of the Nasalis, as their adaptability and specialization has made them quite successful. The common Nasalis, as stated, is going to be the most encountered species you will come across. They are not terribly tough and are going to be distinguished by their pinkish skin tone and lanky arms. When encountering these guys, more often than not a few shots will bring them down, but the issue remains that they attack in masses. Overpowering and killing any would-be Nasali Slayer if you do not keep a level head and kill what is closest. And last light, there was a change to the morphological structure becoming more compact. More muscle was packed onto the arms and shoulders rather than the torso. The head also got larger and had kind of like they ditched the round pig head and replaced it with an angular and visible jawline. The skin is still pulled back from the front around the nose and the mouth and teeth are still very visible and very jagged. The dark Nasalis appear to be stronger than their pinker cousins. They will have darker hair over portions of their body and they are going to be physically tougher than the common Nasalis. Able to take more damage and also deal more damage, this creature is going to be a lot tougher to deal with so you might want to give it the respect it deserves. They appear also interestingly to congregate around the center of the metro, which to me, maybe their interaction with humans has produced a tougher variant, because we are probably fairly aggressive towards them. The Dark Nasalis will retain their agility and speed, making them deadly, if not more so, considering they are tougher kills. Next exists the Green Nasalis. They have a similar strength and lethality to the Dark Nasalis, however, strangely, they also seem to emit a radioactive green fire. This has apparently caused the creature's skin to turn green much like the radiation it emits. They also have another thing going for them. They are actually going to be tougher than the other Nasalis, able to take even more damage than a dark Nasalis. Basically, these things are going to test your ability to reload. Don't mess up. Last, we have the plated Nasalis. Now, you wouldn't be, I guess, ignorant to the fact that these guys even exist. They are very, very rare and very rarely seen. In fact, I don't believe I've actually seen one in the standard campaign. It is in Khan's DLC in a flashback. So I didn't even, I, you don't run into them is basically what I'm going to say. But the plates appear to be literal armor. It's like armor plating on their body, which is obviously going to make them more resistant to bullets. The plating also does not seem to affect the agility of it either, making it pretty much the most deadly Nasalis you will encounter. That is a standard Nasalis. There's more deadly ones out there. So where do these guys actually come from? Well, judging by the nose and propensity to live underground, it's pretty clear to me, and probably also pretty clear to you guys here, that this guy is going to be a mole or a shrew. Interestingly, the shrew is actually a bloodthirsty animal anyways, just not to us. Did you know that a shrew must eat every two to three hours or they will starve? Their metabolism is so high that without food they will quickly run out of glucose, causing their organs to fail. They need to eat roughly 200 to 300% of their body weight to stay alive. So to a shrew, it's literally kill or be killed. This mentality has carried over even though they are much larger now, so their efforts to hunt anything and everything in the area are still there. And humans are now on the menu. Okay, so I know you guys are sitting there right now asking yourself, well wait, where is the wing Nasalis and the Rhino Nasalis because those are the really cool ones. Well, after looking at these two, the morphological traits are so different that they really do deserve their own episodes, which will be coming out. So expect like part two to be over the wing Nasalis and then part three to cover the Rhino or Big Mama. At least I believe it was Big Mama. I'll have to go back through. I would like to thank you guys for watching my video over the Nasalis. If you like the video, don't forget to leave a like. If you really like the video and some of the several other ones I've made, don't forget to tag that sub button and hit the bell so you know every time I upload. Although, once again, I must harp on the fact that there is one guy who used to comment on all my videos about two months ago, and I have not heard from him since. And the last thing he commented was, for some reason, every time you post, I don't see, even though the bell is tagged. 
bag. So that probably doesn't bode well. It might work. Worth a shot, right? Anyways, so the next video I will be going over will be the Wall Guardians from Dead Space. Also, to all my Gears of War fans out there, do not fret. I have not forgot about the series. I will be starting up another series going over the Lambent quite soon. And as always, I would like to thank my patrons. At the Scientist tier, we have Layla Elizarin, and then we got your boy, Master BC. Thank you guys, I really do appreciate it. Next up on our resident tier, we have G. Anderson, John Russo, and Richard Muhlenberg. With our Masters in Biology, we've got Adam Hartswick, Andrew Lawson, Cameron Smith, Ryan Garnum, and Brian H. Briggs. Then, with our Bachelors in Morphological Sciences, we have Eric Scott Gillies, Dustin Ellis, who's also been known as Mailing Address this whole time. I always thought it was really odd that his name was Mailing Address, but it's actually Dustin, so now you know. Classic bro. A Big Fat Snake and Natsuki Chiaki. Thank you guys for the support. I always appreciate it. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed, and as always, I will see y'all in the next one.